Okay, we are recording. I am Brandon Polite, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, and I'm joined by Ade Artis, who is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Michigan Flint in Flint, Michigan. Ade, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So we're talking about your paper, The Argument from Extreme Difficulty in Video Games, which came out uh, in the Journal of Aesthetics and Art Criticism in 2021. Um, and I absolutely love this paper. I taught it this past winter, I guess, in my philosophy of games course. And I think I mentioned this to you, but over half of my students wrote their final papers on your article. Um, they absolutely loved it. The discussion was fantastic. I think we ended up spending two days instead of the original one. Um, and so I'm very excited to talk to you about this. And so in the article, uh, you're talking about the aesthetic experience of difficult gameplay and not just difficult gameplay but extremely difficult gameplay hence the title and the sort of video games you're focusing on are what are known as fast twitch video games and in case anyone out there isn't familiar with that term could you just briefly describe that category for us yeah so i mean i i think the easiest way to think about it is sort of um on the like particular empirical examples and then sort of a concept a rough conceptual category that's hopefully going to capture at least most of those um so empirical examples are games like pac-man and frogger and tron and donkey kong and super mario brothers and i could go on so there's this and and modern ones too but i just think uh, the classical ones are very familiar to almost everyone um arkanoid tetris <laughs> um so those are sort of empirical particulars that i think we have some sense are sort of grouped together even if we hadn't you know known about this the, the notion of fast twitch or twitch gameplay or something like that and so um the thought is is that one thing that sort of un there was a few things that unify these but one thing that unifies them has to do with sort of like you're presented with certain discrete goals, um, oftentimes sort of all at once. So if we take Pac-Man, for example, the entire sort of uh, task is before you. There's a bunch of dots and you got to eat them all and you have to eat them all by moving the joystick. And you can you can stop for short periods, but you can't stop for very long because the ghost will catch you. So so the ghost sort of force you to, to constantly be in motion. Um, and if you sort of go through each of the ones I just mentioned, Tetris, right? If you don't do anything, <laughs> if you don't move either whatever input you're using, but we'll just stick with the joystick, right? Or press the button and move the joystick, then it you lose quickly. Um, and so they all have this feature of sort of requiring kind of continual, um, generally rapid and just, uh, you know, I can talk maybe more about this later, but just to give an example that this isn't in the paper, but it's I think it's one of the things that I think was in in my in the background of my mind um, with the with a game like Super Mario Brothers, it's it the, the original game ran at about 60 frames per second. And a lot of the movements are, are sort of calling for like, you know, frame by frame kind of action almost a so 1 60th of a second is is the kind of resolution of the speed of movements. Um, which is kind of incredible, I think. <laughs> um, so so um, it has this feature of requiring the continual movement. Um, and um, obviously it's going to vary even of the same person. If you play the game enough times and you get better, it won't feel as difficult. But broadly speaking, um, you can tell that most of them are kind of difficult because if you if you went to the arcade back in the day, very few people could win these games and they weren't very long, right? Um, uh, and so that that gives you some sense that that these were very difficult games. Um, and uh, even now, I think if you if you take someone that hasn't played, you know, uh, you know, Frogger or something like that, and you just plop them in front of it and, and say, go, they, they still might find it quite challenging. Um, so um, the, the Twitch gameplay is, is meant to sort of capture that feature of the continual movement combined with the fact that it's continual because it's being forced by the task that's been set to you, which is in each case we can specify very precisely and specifically and easily. 
Yeah, awesome. And, you know, mentioning the frame rate of Mario reminded me, I read something a while ago about professional Tekken players. And so people who don't know Tekken is a fighting game similar to Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat. Um, and like, there's like particular like things that the opponent, you know, so what they do is they watch the opponent's character on the screen and they're like particular things that the, you know, the character will do right before they do a particular move. And it's like something like one five hundredth of a second of, and that's what they're picking up on to know how to block or how to duck or how to counter, right? Is so it's really, really fast paced. And so like, they're just like looking for those tiny micro moves. Um, and like, that's total concentration on, on that thing, which, which relates to, you know, the issue you're dealing with in the article, right? Which is, uh, you know, the skeptical view that, well, players of fast twitch games, and especially of like a very extreme case, like, you know, the Tekken one and the professional Tekken player aren't having aesthetic experiences of the gameplay, right? They're too focused on these complicated, fast paced, you know, finger thumb movements, right? To genuinely have an aesthetic experience of the game. And so why, you know, I sort of just gave the objection, but could you just spell that out a bit more? Yeah, I mean, I think part of part of where it can get its plausibility is if we think about sort of other cases that sort of are, are analogous in certain ways. Um, so if you think about um, driving up a, a kind of semi-treacherous road where maybe your tires aren't in, in perfect shape, you know, and maybe you're not driving a new car and so on. Um, but, you know, you know, you're with somebody else who's a passenger and they look out and they're just stunned by the beautiful scenery. And, you know, they sort of talk about how great it is. And, you know, you would like to see it yourself. But given the fact that your attention is being sort of like constrained by this very difficult task of getting up the mountain, you might endanger yourself if you actually tried to partake in the aesthetic experience of of, of the countryside. Um, whereas, if it were just, you know, a, a, a flat road, let's say with a 25 mile an hour speed limit, you know, and no other cars, you might very well actually take a look the whole time and, and enjoy it. Um, and it looks like the only relevant difference there is the fact that you're engaged in this difficult kind of sensory motor task that's sort of like so absorbing of what you're doing that 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 you sort of miss the show. Um and I think we could cook up a, a, a bunch more sort of similar cases where it looks like the same sort of constraints are being imposed by some sort of this activity that in some sense is, 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 is not intrinsically aesthetic in some sense. I mean, so again, even with the driving case, you know, we could sort of make it, force it to be aesthetic in some way, but there's an important sense in which I think a lot of people feel like, no, we're missing out and it sucks. And I wish the other person was driving. Like, it's like, I think that's part of what's driving the intuition. Like, wait a minute, you know, what's going on here? You know? Um, so, so insofar as um, the video games case is relevantly similar um, then it, then you might think that could help motivate the idea that, well, isn't this one of those cases where actually you're missing out? And, you know, and you could and you could point to maybe cases where, you know, um, there's some beautiful scenery going on, but, you know, you, you the player can't can't indulge in that sort of thing because it's like the car. Right. So you might even sort of almost kind of replicate the conditions or maybe even driving right in a driving game, you know, or a game that, that we're driving as a central component. Um, so, so that I think helps to motivate the case against being able to, as the player. And again, I mean, someone watching can, as they can look at the background of the scenery and maybe the player themselves can record it and watch it back or whatever, or, you know, reflect on it later it's not that they can't be aesthetically engaged with sort of too cool, but rather, you know, only sort of with respect to the player currently engaging in the activity itself. So that's the, that's the sort of limitation that's built in to ensure that these other modes of aesthetic engagement are just excluded and not excluded broadly speaking, but just excluded for the sake of trying to make the, this objection plausible and make it look like the driving mountain, the mountain up the road sort of case. Yeah, awesome. And so in the article, your response is to say that, 
okay, that sort of makes sense, right? That's you know very much plausible as a view, but the player is having a very particular sort of aesthetic experience and one that doesn't seem to be straightforwardly available to someone sitting next to them watching, right? Or them watching back later. They're having a proprioceptive experience of what they're doing. And it's, you know, very much an audiovisual um sort of not just audiovisual, but you know, mechanic, uh, you know, mechanical. I'm losing words here, but uh you know what I mean. So why don't you give the response and not me? <laughs> no, I mean it is, I do think it it is it there's something sort of I think unexpected in 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 the view, right? And I think it's unexpected in part because of our traditional sort of categories, at least in sort of Anglophone aesthetics, not only Anglophone, but just, you know, that's what is sort of the the terrain in which I'm I'm working uh, for the most part. And um, in that tradition, the, the sort of fine arts of things like painting, um, music, uh, theater, uh, poetry, these sorts of things um, have been center stage. Uh, and in in those kinds of sort of artwork experiences um, and communities and and discussions, there's a kind of like the the person who's as it were you know sort of engaging with in some way the work of art is is like not the maker generally right and not only are they not the maker they're also relatively passive right like you go to a movie and you sort of just like sit down you know like you go to a painting and you sort of just look kind of thing like it's not obviously that's an exaggeration and I, I, in the sense of i don't think that the viewer is like purely passive in any way it's just at least physically right like you're not asked to sort of like walk around the track while you watch the movie that's projected on the screen or something like that you're 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 you know we go to music shows and again sit down not all the time but so so i think that that's part of what's going on is that part of the our, our intuitions about what counts as aesthetic is directed in these traditional manners towards things that don't emphasize either the agency of the engager or bodily movement either um as because and so for example dance has been i think under discussed with sort of like comparison to its importance um uh so so that's part of what's going on but the other part of what's going on is it, it actually i mean part of it i think was sort of the accident of just like I, I was trying to find a reason why actually like there were a lot of popular new games that I didn't like. Um, and in the paper or the one I mentioned, which is outstanding in this regard is Assassin's Creed. I mean, despite the, I like elements of them and I play, I've played more of them than I probably should have kind of thing, you know, um, uh, <laughs> And uh, I, there's a quote in the paper where, you know, there's like an expletive or whatever that, that's in a review. So I can say, look, I'm just quoting it. But it's about the, it's about the controls, you know, and how crappy they are. And it's like if I could if I, just like reflecting again, like on all the mistakes that that have been made in sort of the, the modern edifice of video games. One of the things and it may be the thing that bothers me the most is generally the imprecision and the, the muddiness of the movement in comparison to the classical arcade style, right? You know, you go back to that and it just feels like another universe that just, I mean, and, and there, there's maybe like a, a couple exceptions. I like, I, I think some of the, um, the 3D Mario, really all of them, the 3D Mario games, I would say are sort of a, a, like the sort of stunning exception to this rule of crappy movement, particularly in, in 3D style games, but not only, but especially 3D style. Um, and uh, so I don't think it's universal, but I think it's just the, it's the exception that proves the rule. Because if you play one of those and, and you're sort of just dancing through the movements as it were, and you're just popping around and doing stuff and it feels incredible. And then you go to really, any of the others <laughs> you know just pick pick from any of the but assassin's creed is just an example of the the sluggishness the weird collision stuff where like you don't know where the edges of stuff is so you don't know what you're going to bump into timing like the, the 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 relationship of the the button presses and the movements and the delays 
and and just weird animations and the climbing of course which you know is it's oddly seeming to have gotten like worse and worse over the years somehow and it wasn't great to begin with it's just incredible stuff i mean who knows it, it might i mean this is sort of a little bit orthogonal but i mean there i it, I don't know if you've seen any of the recent news about just the sort of uh, the, pro the internal company cultural problems they've had over at uh, Ubisoft, Ubisoft or Ubisoft. I don't know how it's pronounced, um, but who knows? Maybe that's why it's it's declined over time and it wasn't good. So, you know, I, I think part of what happened is I just latched on to that, you know, and thought, OK, let's let's try to let's work through this. Let's just see. And, you know, when I'm writing papers, a lot it's it, there's lots and lots of stuff that comes out that's like 90 percent doesn't go anywhere. But it's just I got to work through it kind of thing, you know, and I was just working through kind of what is it? What like why am I? I thought I don't know why I have to think through like the difference in in the feeling basically how did do, why does it feel so different when you play assassin's creed and when you pay, play pac-man it feels way better to play pac-man so we got to understand that <laughs> i love that that's absolutely awesome right so what you're describing is games where you're fighting against the controller right and fighting against the controller means that you're not absorbed in the gameplay versus games where you don't have to fight against the controls you're you're just you know in sync with you know your finger movements are in sync with what the character is doing on the screen and so you're fully absorbed in the game activity and that feels radically different and so this weekend i played uh speaking of classic arcade games i played donkey kong um you know there is a, a restaurant that had you know just an old school donkey kong but obviously had been played way too much and so the controls, you know, my, it just wasn't working and I was just getting so pissed off because of that. I know how this is supposed to feel. This doesn't feel that way because the controls are sticking and sluggish and, and not working properly. And so, yeah, I deeply empathize with what you're describing with respect to Assassin's Creed and other sorts of games like that. Right. And so that's really interesting that that was sort of your in into this topic It's these games feel radically different and it has something to do with the controls and the, you know, how the controls are working are preventing absorption and are, are frustrating absorption and engagement with the game in the way that you want to engage with it. Exactly. Exactly. And so then like once that, that, that was sort of the first step. And then I started just again, thinking through, okay, so what happens when it went in the good case, why is it that it feels so good? Um, and then my thinking was, well, in the in the if I'm trying to sort of reflect on what's going on when I'm playing, like the, the only recent examples that I can think of that I think really still can do this on the 3D side of things, at least, is are really, I mean, not the only ones, but the big well-known ones are the Super Mario 3D ones. They still can do this. And so, you know, our, our viewers uh, might be able to sort of connect to that more easily than some of the classical arcade ones, but be that as it may, um, uh, the next step was sort of like, okay, so what part of what's going on is when I'm playing the games that have great controls, the, the, the intentional object is always in the game world. Right. So, so that sort of is a characteristic and it's like, oh, okay. So and then I'm thinking to myself, there must be pro part of probably what's going on is there are some conditions that need to be met or satisfied in order for that to, to happen, for it to be that that's just the constant intentional object of, of everything I'm doing. Um, and and to, having thought about perception broadly, human perception, I think it's hard I, maybe I'm wrong, but I just feel like a lot of people that I've met who do professional philosophy have thought a lot about perception, you know, that that just reflection in general, whether or not it's some sort of central resource program or whatever, like, doesn't matter, you know, it's just I feel like it's it's something that um, is 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 we, we reflected on it enough to maybe transfer some of those to these other cases. And and so I'm thinking about, OK, if you take um there are these discussions in perception about transparency and the fact that, you know, some of the, now this is, again, I'm not endorsing this, but some people that want to get to the conclusion that in some sense, the notion of experience as this sort of distinct category is, is maybe unfounded is because it's sort of like we, when we reflect on our visual experience, we end up sort of discussing 
features of things in the world, not features of some experience distinct from the things in, in, that we're perceiving in the world. Um, so colors are not sort of like, they're not presented to us intentionally or whatever in our awareness as features of our experience, they're presented to us as features of the object. So it's like, it's something like that is going on. And what is it? So the analogy is something like this. In the case of perception, um, the, you you sort of get rid of the transparency means get rid of, getting rid of the experience, the intentional object perceptually and the mo sort of motor intentional object perceptually is the object, even if there is an experience. And that's the thing that I think is important. It's like, OK, maybe there is experience or something like that. It's just that it's not the thing that we're directed towards or we don't appear to ourselves to be directed towards experiences. We appear to be directed towards things in the world. So what you remove is the, in some sense, the controls, right? I mean, obviously the controls are physically there. So in that sense, it's maybe different if, if, if whatever, if you're a skeptic of experience, you might just think they don't exist, but you know, the controller is there, but it's not there for you. <laughs> it's not there as your intentional object. It's, it's there in some other way. Um, and so what happens in the cases where it fails is what's what's failing to happen is I'm failing to be able to, my, my the intentional object is not sort of like continually the world. It's interrupted. Or maybe I can't even get there, you know, in the worst case scenario. But even in the good cases, like I sort of get there, you know, but it's sort of like I'm not there. I, it's not clear or something like that, The you know, sort of with analogy to uh visual perception or something like that so there's some sense in which okay i'm sort of directed towards the things in the game world but not in that intimate way not in that sort of the way in which it becomes this world where <laughs> my my intentional sort of direction is is completely in there <laughs> if that makes sense <laughs> yeah yeah and it sort of reminds me of you know playing nintendo or or sega as a kid and you know you're holding the control and you're moving the controller as if that's going to do something right it's not motion controlled or anything it's just you smashing buttons but you know you're trying to get the player to jump you're trying to get mario to jump so you raise your hands it's because you're so absorbed in the control to what's happening on the screen is in such you know close sync with one another that you're in the game rather than sort of in the world in a sense and you know, those moments where you become aware of the controller are typically moments where you screw up, right? It's, you know, if I'm playing, you know, I've got a guitar behind me, if I'm playing a guitar solo that I've played a hundred times, and, you know, I'm just in it, but then I fuck up a note, I'm out of it, right? I'm now aware of what my hands are doing. I'm now aware of the position of them, right? And it takes me out of it, right? And so, you know, or a string breaks or something, right? It's the same sort of thing that, oh, now I'm aware of, my hands, what they're touching, what they're doing, as opposed to I'm just absorbed in the music or in the case of video games, I'm absorbed in the world of the game. Exactly, exactly. So then it was like, all right, you know, we've got now we've got another piece of this sort of conceptual puzzle. Um, and so then it was sort of a matter of thinking through, OK. It can't be that I'm not saying that it can't be, but <sighs> Our relation to the intentional objects in the classical case are sort of, they're structured in this particular way. They're structured by the goal, right? So there's this way in which, you know, this is this is why the focus is on these fast Twitch games, because that way it sort of like constrains the, pro the, the problem area. So we can isolate, well, here's how we sort of re-describe in more precise terms, the going up the mountain problem sort of analogy um, and the attention that it takes for the driver. And so the player is the driver. So we can now sort of try to restate that with a little bit more precision and say that because the goals of the game world are so difficult to reach, then it puts this player in this position where their intentional object is demanded to be exclusively on achieving that particular sequence of movements in this case because these classical arcade games are all movement based obviously in the world but because we're relating to it through the controller it's us in the world so to speak in the game world moving through it um and so it's sort of like now we can say the sort of 
if we think about Pac-Man or something like that, or, or Frogger or Donkey Kong or Tetris, if we think about that's the sort of road, you know, and so it's sort of like we're we're in the world, but our it's so intense and difficult that uh, the 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 structure of the world is sort of like narrowed in a way that prevents all other uh, activity besides the achievement of that task. And so that's the sort of you know sort of stronger, more direct version of this restated problem of uh, of how we're supposed to aesthetically appreciate it. And that's when I just started reflecting on the, on this movement stuff, because the thought was something like this: that well, we got to think about the nature of movement in order to make any headway here, because it's not like, I mean, it's one of the it's one of the most you know you go into a media a, a, a museum you know people walk up to a, a painting stand there look at it maybe chit chat a little whatever move on stand there look at it they're not doing anything physically demanding same thing with a movie theater um, so so I mean even reading a book can be difficult but not physically generally demanding so so many of the traditional arts on which aesthetic reflection is based are grounded in the engager sort of not doing anything physically demanding with the exception of dance an understudied area and under uh, under uh, worked area um, and so part of the paper links to dance because of the fact that it's one of the areas in which there's been some discussion of aesthetic appreciation of human movement the other area in which uh sort of human movement as a topic sort of for sort of philosophical reflection has been uh, more discussed has been in philosophy of sport, which again is also in the paper. And so that's that's where I started sort of just sort of going through stuff and and basically stealing <laughs> from some of this existing work on aesthetics of bodily movement and bodily movement and sports and basically marrying the two together by sort of like isolating some interesting features from each and and asking like does this does this maybe fit what's happening when we're playing twitch video games and i and my conclusion is it looks like it does and and then so <laughs> yeah yeah right so you know a lot of you know, maybe more old school attention, you know, philosophical attention would be on the audience's experience of watching a dance troupe perform or watching a sports team perform. And, you know, the more recent literature over the last 15 years or so is focusing on the experience of the dancer themselves or of the, you know, player, you know, on, you know, the baseball player, soccer player, et cetera, themselves. Right. And what it is that they're experiencing. And, you know, they're not merely providing an aesthetic experience for a viewer. Rather, they're having, or in addition to that, they're also having an aesthetic experience themselves of their bodily movement and the gracefulness, the elegance, the difficulty, the frustration, right, et cetera. And it seems like the same thing's happening with with gamers, right, who are playing these fast twitch video games, right, is there's, you know, the absorption in the game is facilitated by these elegant, graceful movements that are suited to the task at hand within the game itself. Right, and I mean, this. so this isn't in the paper, but I do think it's the sort of thing that sort of like um, is is relevant in sort of, showing how um, concepts which are salient in this area um, and can be brought to bear for analytical purposes are are generally sort of not really treated, I, I find, in much of the just broad philosophical literature, contemporary. Just as an example, in philosophy of sport, there's this sort of notion of a flow state or something like that, or being in the zone or something like that as a distinctive mode of consciousness that I actually think many people, even if they haven't uh, played sports, still still can access through other activities. Um, and so I think it's a very sort of an interesting, both on experience on an experiential level, but also on a conceptual level. Um, but you don't really find it used, deployed. You know, there's all sorts of other concepts, but not those kinds. Um, and but I think clearly in the case of the player of video games, that kind of concept is going to be quite relevant 
um, in, in, in terms of they're trying to get at, um, for example, you know, what's the draw? Why are, why are these, why have video games turned out to be so successful? I mean, even, I mean, th there's new 2D classical arcade style games that coming out more now than ever. Um, so it's sort of like, that sort of almost calls for some sort of explanation like that, you know, something there's, okay, maybe it's just, you know, people are deluded and they have poor taste and that will soon be revealed or something. It will be revealed at the end of the world. I don't know. But, you know, uh, I think a, a, like a, a maybe a more helpful approach would be to try to be as sympathetic and charitable as possible and sort of say, let's just assume that there's something going on here when people are playing particularly classical arcade style video games that is in, that's just central to the human experience and one piece of it might be the the the, the affordance is made for something like a flow state in the paper i talk more about this the concept of harmony and elegance but just for something a little bit that i've recently been thinking more about is uh, the way in which video games afford that i think in a way that very few other things in our culture do if we just think about activities in which i mean i do think they happen outside of sports but it's kind of a, almost a, it, it, it's sort of odd it's like well outside of that it is a little bit tricky you know like you, you'd have to sort of work on it like hmm, okay like when when has that happened or something like you know i do think sometimes and even you know when we tr I, I don't know if th this has probably happened to you before when when you're sort of you know if i'm shaking some pepper or something and i slip and it falls and then like i try to catch it or something with the other hand like sometimes you succeed you know and it's but just barely <laughs> you know and it's just like, like for a second there you were in the zone and you look at it and you're like ah you, get this, you feel like you know uh neo or something you know at the end of the <laughs> matrix you know kind of the, you crack the code you know so i think they're like i do think in some sense they're relatively common but in terms of the, the way in which athletes discuss it is much is it's this long continuous thing that can last for up you know who knows sometimes half an hour long periods of time in the case of something like golf, where a round could take five hours, you know, that's five hours, presumably, they're somewhat feeling it, you know. Um, and so I think that just as an example of kind of uh, the, the sorts of things that have occurred to me reflecting on human movement from the perspective of aesthetics of the mover, but also with the game component, I feel like it just requires the sport because otherwise you're missing out on the fact that the, of the constraints these that are not that don't exist in dance like okay you have con some constraints in dance for example of your own body obviously but those are also in, in video games the constraints you have in video games that are different from in kind from those in dance are, are the, the the constraints imposed by the task there's sort of there's no obvious analogy. Now, I do present, you know, I try to make the case in the paper that, well, maybe you could come up with the analogy if, you know, you're you're studying a kind of dance that has these that's very prescribed by rules or something like that. But I still would there would still wonder about the goal. You know, I mean, maybe you could build that in and, you know, maybe someone wants to change the weather and it's by these prescribed rules. So it's not that you can't build in cases that fit. But. I just feel like it's kind of like a constant in video games in a way that it's not in dance, right? It seems like, you know, there's, you know, lots and lots of dance is not constrained by the kinds of game-like structures that you find in video games, whereas lots and lots of video games are constrained by, by that. And in the Twitch ca case, that the classical arcade Twitch case, they all are. So that's one sort of conclusion that I came to in, ref in trying to sort of figure out why it is that the, the literature and philosophy of sport I found to be essential ultimately in trying to describe the aesthetics of the, of the player. And in the sport stuff, what you get is the constraints, right? Um, so, so <laughs> you sort of, you get that structural feature of these uh, sort of very narrow goals and these very sort of strict, relatively strict rules and so on that you do get in video games. Yeah, I really like that, right? It's it's the 
restrictions and the limitations that are placed upon you that allow you to zero in on doing this particular type of motion or this set of types of motion uh, as a way of uh, achieving these goals, right? That allows you to get absorbed in uh, playing games in a way that, or at least fast switch video games, right? In a way that, or sports in a way that it, it's hard to find that in ordinary everyday life. Um, you know, and you talk about it uh, in the article in Tina Wynn's terms of like the harmony of capacity, right? Where you're just, you know, hitting your limit and, and uh, you know, excelling, right? In the case that you mentioned of, you know, you drop the pepper shaker and you just grab it. You're like, damn, that was amazing, right? Uh, but it happens, but it's rare, I think. Um, whereas in video games, they're structured in such a way to just give you hits of that over and over. And especially in, you know, classic arcade games where they get more difficult as time goes on, or, you know, you mentioned tech Tetris a long time ago, right? It speeds up as it goes on. And, you know, I just remember, you know, as a kid playing Tetris on Nintendo and just like every once in a while I'd get in the zone as you're describing, I'd get in that flow state and like, I'm like seeing three moves ahead somehow. And it's, it is like Neo, like looking at just the ones and zeros, you know, and like, I see everything, right. I know it all, right. It is exactly that experience. And it is, you know, this really intense sort of thing. And there's, there is an aesthetic to it besides the sound, besides the visual, which is traditionally what aesthetics is focused on. It is this proprioceptive thing of I'm doing this with, you know, bodily movements in the case of video games, just, you know, fingers or really just thumbs if I'm thinking of Nintendo, right? Um, once you get more complicated, you know, with triggers and stuff on like the Nintendo 64 or PlayStation 2 controllers, then, you know, your index fingers get involved, et cetera. But uh, yeah, that's just really cool and interesting. So yeah, and that's the sort of, in terms of the sort of aesthetic kind of payoff, that's a kind of the the sort of paradigm case or one of the two paradigm cases where they're, they are, they generally have this, this, the good ones um, have this, and this is the evaluation of good, part of the evaluation of good and bad is one of the chief sort of aesthetic virtues that are both possible and often achieved in the cases of great ones is when it's able to pull, to, to extract that matching of the player ability. And so it's difficult, but A, not impossibly difficult and B, sort of tailored in a way to kind of like be in almost the dialectical relationship with the player where, you know, initially it's very difficult. You're able to achieve a certain degree of excellence, but then it becomes more difficult than you're able to achieve, but then you achieve enough excellence. And, and, and it has this dialectical sort of structure that's just incredible. Now in, in the cases, in some cases you can win and actually in most cases, the one, the one, well, there's the one sort of odd exception of the classical video games is uh, Pac-Man, ironically, although I believe you can only be 286 levels or something like that because then it crashes because the data gets like re rebooted or something. But anyway, in, 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 in Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., Super Mario, you know, uh, these are Frogger, these that you can actually, you know, win. Um, in which case that's sort of like, the end. I mean, and so that is one limitation that I think is sort of important to sort of keep in the background. And I think it's one of the reasons why sort of video games didn't stop there in a way, you know, like it's sort of it has its own sort of internal perfection, I think. But also because of that, it has its own limitation in some sense, because it's sort of like at some in, at some point you find the perfect marriage to finally be able to win. Now, that doesn't necessarily end the story for the speedrunners. Right, because then that's the other thing is that the speedrunners want to keep going. The players that aren't satisfied, you know, and obviously you know, Super Mario Bros. That the set, the set, the second highest speed run for Super Mario Brothers was just set three months ago. So you know, people are still <laughs> still speed running to Super Mario. So 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 if for those who it's not enough to simply win, there actually is further to go. And in that sense, it's sort of it's open ended. And that's a, another but for, for I think for a, sort of the average gamer, maybe that sort of that that enjoys these sorts of games, but also enjoys other games. If you were to try to say, well, maybe what's one reason? Like, well, I beat it kind of thing, you know, like and it's done. Whereas some of the modern ones you might 
you know, the non speed runners often still play newer games after they beat them in a way that, you know, is unusual in the classical arcade style. Yeah, awesome. So talking about other sorts of video games on the flip side or the far extreme of fast twitch is open world RPGs, right? Where, you know, thinking about like Zelda, Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom or uh, whatever, right? Shadow of the Colossus, et, et cetera. You know, these are open world games where you can spend hours doing nothing but wandering, picking flowers, gathering food, making food, eating food, sleeping, right? The, the, these are, you know, very much extremely different from fast twitch games. And I know you've been thinking about open world video games recently and, and the different sort of uh, aesthetic experience that they afford players. And so could you just talk about that a bit? Sure. Yeah, no. So this is, so my, so my thinking was is like, let, let's, let's just say for the sake of argument that the stuff about the twitch gameplay is acceptable in some sense that this gives us at least a baseline sort of understanding for this phenomenon of this the massive appeal like how do we explain this well one way to explain it is by pointing to unique aesthetic experiences that are afforded by our proprioceptive kind of uh awareness that's not directed towards it right or the intentional object is still the stuff in the world but nevertheless it still you know can reward us in this in, in in with these sort of beautiful movements and harmonious movements where our abilities of moving matches perfectly um in that sort of thrilling aesthetic way um well that's there are other video games than that right there those aren't the only other video games i'm not trying to give an account for all video games because i think that i'm not sure there's really too much of a point in that just because I just feel like the category is so heterogeneous that there's unlikely to be anything super interesting that we can really say about all video games. But we can say something interesting maybe about a decent sort of subset of, of video games. And so sort of my thinking was, well, clearly open, the, I mean, the, the sort of, I don't want, I hesitate to say gold standard, but just in terms of sort of like the the kind of, popular and commercial dominance of the modern open world game is sort of you know indisputable um and they share they're they're sort of the the, the modern pac-man kind of thing you know they're they're sort of like the, the the new version of that what is it that has the sort of kind of near universal appeal to video game players and that's 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 keeping them for 40 hours on average i think for for most of these roughly um to to completion and many people spend many more hours than that um even just so i mean for myself personally i'm not, i do like to take my time a little so to speak like i'm not someone that rushes through open world games and so um yeah i mean i stopped playing skyrim on, on my ps3 back in the day because it just the memory file got so big that it janked out the system, you know, like it couldn't run properly because it was just like, um, what I, it was at like a hundred some hours or 100, 110 hours or something like that. Um, so my thought was, well, is there anything that can be like understood on that front? And my thought is, well, clearly th there's a weird way in which the classical arcade is embedded within open world games, sort of right, like you regularly have encounters that look very similar structurally to what's going on in like a Galaga or whatever, you know, like you're doing like, oh, there's that thing, shoot it, dump, 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 move out of the way because it's shooting at you. And it's like, oh yeah, that was Galaga, right? Like, so like, you know, so it's like, that seems like the same. So that there's a foothold, all right? So we can sort of just take everything that already, that we already said about the classical arcade and at least have an account of those sequences. But then there's this other part, which is the non-intense movement. And, and in fact, I mean, the particular thing that that sort of struck me as a way to just light bulb and illuminate the whole thing is the, just the lack of a timer. You know, it's sort of encapsulated in that. It's like you go to all these other games, there's a timer on every level, but not there. Um, and so in the open world context. And so it seems like arguably that's an invitation to, to boredom. And so this is just like the original one starts with a criticism. This one sort of the, my reflection sort of starts with a criticism, namely sort of 
you know, why would you like, isn't, isn't boredom sort of intrinsically aesthetically a problem? Um, and so I've been sort of just working through why we might think that even though we'll concede that at least with, compared to the Twitch movement sequences, the movement sequences in the open world, let's concede they're just generally boring. Um, and I think we the one way to sort of dramatize it is remove everything, all of the sort of interactive points from the world for a minute, right? And remove all of the visual interests from the world, delete it. And all you have left is just a barren open world with no activities. And the only thing you can do is move around in it, right? I think most people would think that would be horrible and it would be horrible because it would be unbelievably boring. Now you sort of you can just sort of like arguably use that as a kind of a a a, a wrench to to get the case going similarly in the open world context to the, the 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 fact that it's much more boring and that should be a bad thing and yet it's not and so then the sort of the the sort of the next kind of thing to try to figure out is what can we say about you know. Uh, why it's sort of it's okay to be boring <laughs> in in open world video games and why that it doesn't turn out to be a, a problem <laughs> yeah and one thing you know one thought i have is that sort of the fictional world of these games is way more developed than in classic arcade games right that i'm playing mario you know, the original Super Mario Brothers, I kind of don't give a shit about the princess and what's going on with her and that she's been kidnapped. It's just a goal the game gives me and it's fun to try to achieve it, right? Whereas in open world games, you know, the story is so rich and the world is so well developed that it, it seems like a different sort of absorption than in fast twitch play where it's I'm absorbed in this fictional world and I come to care about this character's goals. I take them on as, as mine in a deeper way than I take on Mario's goals or I take on Pac-Man's goals or Miss Pac-Man's goals or whoever in these classic arcade games. Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. So exactly. So the thought is, is that um, what, when we refill the world, we then, and then think through, okay, there, some portion of the world might be barren, but then we hit a portion of the world that's not barren. And generally, these are related to some some larger story as well. And so there's sort of this nesting that happens where, yes, there are boring sequences. But to take the case you just mentioned, right, think about the way in which, you know, the difference between sort of my boredom, if I'm watching a movie that's not interesting, compared to sort of the boredom that I experience when I'm in the waiting room waiting for someone I care about or something like that to, to come out of the, the, the dentist or whatever, you know, like they're, they're just in some sense, they're, they're different. And I think part of the way you get at that difference is the relationship to the entire situation of, and this care. <laughs> and the fact that in some sense you don't really, and then there's a problem with movies, right? Like you don't care about the, it's a classic criticism that people make. I mean, video games as well, right? Like if you don't care about these characters, then, you know, your boredom is going to be bad boredom because there, there's going to be nothing in some sense beyond it. Um, now there is actually uh, uh, some some argument out there that I that I, I that I don't think is relevant but interesting about whether sort of resolutely boring art can still be in some sense interesting that is only boring like not with no nothing interesting about it um, maybe I mean I I just I feel like there's let there's you you can't go as far with kind of this kind of resolute style of boredom that this the, the the conditional boredom is more interesting because it's a richer kind of feel to sort of think through and the conditional boredom is like they're boring parts of some work or experience or in this case a playthrough of a video game but the boredom certainly from the perspective of the story i think more resembles in the case of, of a video game with a compelling story that you're involved in the person in the waiting room like yes it's boring but there's some sense in which well the, the boring is part of what like part of what it means to both care for someone and like be in a caring relationship with someone for a long period of time is the boredom like it's it's like a component it's like a 
it's it's hard to describe, but there's it's not the same because of the fact that it's related to other events, which then sort of uh, give the the relationship as a whole its particular texture. Um, and if you took it away, actually, it would be maybe too much. I mean, think about if you if you feel intensely towards someone and it was always that way, I feel like that can that's like a recipe for burnout. Like, you know, like we, we again, the finitude axiom, right? We're finite. We can't always be turned on, you know, like we can't always be at volume 11. Um, and so in some long term relationship of care between people or communities, um, you know, boredom helps provide that necessary sort of uh, landscape and complexity and richness also, right? Because without that, it wouldn't have all of these different, you know, the, the kinds of stories people tell it becomes, it becomes funny when it's that sort of thing. Like you wouldn't believe what happened when I was waiting in the, in the waiting room, it was so boring. And then I pull out my phone, but I couldn't get a signal and I hadn't downloaded anything, blah, blah, blah. you know, that becomes a fun story if it's in, in one context, but in another, it just sucks. Like it's a complaint. Kind of thing. Yeah. Right. It'd be, you know, it's akin to like watching an action movie, right. That, you know, the John Wick movies, for example, right. Like there are moments where they're just sort of quiet, not much happens. That's fine because it's sort of the characters taking a breath and we're taking a breath before the next killing spree. <laughs> Right. And it's the same with with these video games, right? That, yeah, there are moments of like intense, you know, fast twitch sort of gameplay, but it's it's interspersed with these moments of boredom. And I think that helps to facilitate your identification with the character because you're bored in just the way that traveling this world on the quest would have intense moments of boredom where you're just like, all right, I'm on a you know f flat plane. There's the horizon. I'm heading there. I'm gonna walk there for three days, and you know, so there's a sense in which it's it's um, yeah, helping to facilitate identification with the character that you're playing as in a deeper way than you know I identify with what Mario is doing or I identify with what Pac Man or the little well, space okay, so Station Beaters is doing. Exactly. No. And and so another thing that I've been sort of thinking about is is just the way in which. Um, as you say, you know, it makes it arguably much more believable. And if you're if you're if you're trying to achieve something, I don't I don't know what exactly I'm thinking about is the object of the achievement quite yet, but whatever it is, these video games seem to be trying to achieve something too, right? So part of what's going on is they, they, they're they they're trying to make it so that players have a certain kind of engagement with the game. Um, and the thought is, is that one feature of this is believability with respect to kind of like world making. And it's sort of like part of what if real life has a lot of boredom in it, you don't necessarily have to replicate all of real life's boredom, but like, you know, to the extent that like our lives do have a lot of boredom with them to get buy-in for the world building style of the project, I feel like it becomes almost a necessity, maybe not, but it's like, it's hard for me to imagine how you get the level of sort of like genuine sort of believability in the world without there potentially being a great deal of boredom in it, including in, in the movements. I mean, because after all, again, for, for, for most of us, I actually think sort of there's, you know, I'm not sure how necessary, I'm not sure how much maybe we, as humanity, maybe we could change our ways with our attitudes towards like t teaching young people to try to make their way bodily movement wise through the world in a more interesting, exciting manner. I mean, it might make our lives better actually, if we maybe didn't have as much boredom in our, in our, in our movements in everyday life. So I'm not saying that it's like a good thing at the level that it's at or whatever, but regardless, we, we're going to have to wait in doctor's rooms. We're going to have to, whatever, you know, wait for the AC if we're, you know, lucky enough to have a car in the heat or something, you know, to ramp up or, you know, it's just, if we just think about your day and all the times where you were, so there was just some task that didn't require any physical movement or just required something that just was very uninteresting and you kind of didn't want to. <laughs> um, but 
given that that's such a huge part of our lives, it would be almost weird and almost unbelievable in some sense. And this is where the, the classical Arcadians are sort of fantastical. And this is this is also a virtue. I mean, it's, it's, own, it's a distinct virtue though, right? It's like, yes, it's fantastical also in part because it's not boring and because our lives are, and it takes us away from that. It gives us something else for a minute. Like, oh, and especially, you know, people that maybe wouldn't have much else where that's their, that's the way in which they get that. Um, on the other hand, if we want to make sense of the modern open world sort of genre, um, I think that it's going to be important to sort of just tell, tell a convincing story of that kind. Um, but then we, we, we get closer at least to that larger subset. You know, we start with this very small set of the, um, the Twitch style, uh, fast Twitch games and, you know, Hopefully having something to say about the open world titles gives us a little bit more. And, 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 and potentially, I think, again, there could be sort of conceptual stuff. I mean, the stuff about capacities and sort of aptness of fit. If you look at some of the literature, you know, on, you know, um, just tr trying to find value in human life, um, I think a good deal of it has to do with sort of the fit between having certain sorts of, you know, attitudes towards one's own projects and and sort of like having projects that are, for lack of a better word, sort of worthy of our attitudes, <laughs> um, you know, sort of having something to love, but also something to that th that object should be worthy of being loved in some sense. Um, and, and I think there's a sense in which the, the, the notion of harmony has structurally has this interesting sort of aptness of fit that also bears some sorts of, you know, at least family resemblance to the case of the, the sort of value or meaning of life. Um, and similarly with the flow state, I mean, and, and under sort of utilized, <laughs> under reflected philosophically, uh, that might be quite useful for sort of understanding all sorts of important parts of li our lives that have hitherto sort of been oddly, I think, oddly neglected. But uh, that's just my sort of soapbox yeah. <laughs> stance. I love that. Well, I think we should end it on that note because that's a great note to end on. So, Ade, thank you so much for joining me. This is a really, really fantastic discussion. It was great. It was very fun. And I, I love doing it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks.